Just for one <laughs> Sunday morning here, um, we've been in Romans. We started Romans chapter 9. And here's my challenge to use a class in Romans 9. When I mention the word Israel, what comes to mind? Amen. I'll leave you with that. Go with me, to, not with me this morning, but uh, when we get back to Romans 9, you'll find Paul's to heart's desire in Romans 9 and Romans 10 is that his kinsmen, the nation of Israel, would be saved. But there's so much to do with Israel. Israel is always in the news. Have you noticed that? I don't believe that's by accident. Amen. Israel seems to be the center of things. So when I mention the name and the word Israel, think about that. What does that bring to mind? What, what is a, what, what, what's your first thought? And with that, we're going to change gears this morning, amen, just for this morning. And we're going to look at a subject, I just simply put contentment. Uh, if you didn't get what you wanted for Christmas, and you're murmuring and <laughs> complaining, why this lesson is for me, amen, or you. But however, if you look with me in the book of Luke chapter 12, this is kind of an end of the year wrap it up lesson in a sense I felt uh, moved to the Lord to bring just a little bit of a different lesson this morning. Um, we're going to briefly look at contentment and then the question is there room for it to be discontented or discontentment. But Luke chapter 12, I think one of the keys to being content or learning to be content is learning not to covet. Luke chapter 12 verse 13 and one of the company said unto him, Master speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Yeah, that's, I've had some experience with that. He said unto him, <laughs> Man who made me a judge or a divider over you? He said unto them, Take heed. And look how God, he puts a priority on things here. He said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. One of the first keys to being content is learning not to covet. That's a tough lesson, isn't it? Amen? It is a hard lesson. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, you're probably familiar with these verses. In Hebrews 13, if you would please, verse 5 says, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Again, one of the keys, I think, to learning to be content is learning not to covet. God knows all about our needs, and he's, if we were honest with ourselves, has met a lot of our wants very hair of our head are numbered. Look with me here, if you would please, back to Luke chapter 12 again. Something else is, quit fretting and worrying. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, I'm fine one to, to, to throw that advice out, right? Um, I think I'm a part owner of etc. and whoever makes that, amen. I take etc. and when I don't think I, or if I think I have a headache, I take an etc. And then somebody told me it's probably taking all the Excedrin creates the headache, so then you take more Excedrin. Amen? Yeah, that's another story. But quit your fretting and worrying. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything. I may have company this morning. Luke chapter 12, if you would please, in verse 22. Luke 12, 22 tells us, He said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what she shall eat, neither for the body what she shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then not be able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Amen. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth what ye have need of these things, that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, Amen. and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't covet. 
That's a lesson to learn. If you're having troubles with that and you're challenged with it, ask God for help with it. The fretting and worrying, ah, I wish I could just say there was a silver bullet, but there is. It's the Lord. Amen. Yes, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Amen. Yeah. First Timothy chapter 6. I'm going quickly through these first ones because really the lesson is the latter part. So bear with me here. First Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> I need reminding of this. Perhaps I'll have company this morning. But in First Timothy chapter 6, <laughs> verse 6, it says, But God in us with contentment is great gain. Amen. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. In having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Boy, there's a lot in that verse, isn't there? Amen. It ought to rearrange God's children's thinking and how we look at things. Amen. We need material possessions to live. We need food. We need a raiment. But God knows just how much and when. Amen. And we're not taking it with us. Look with me in Psalm chapter 49. It ought to change kind of our thinking a little bit. It ought to prioritize things in our life as a Christian. Look with me in Psalm 49. You may be familiar with this, but just look carefully at the wording of this chapter. Psalm 49 uh, verse 6, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He's like the beasts that perish. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men shall praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is an honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perished. Folks, you're not taking it with you. Amen. 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 Well, that's out of it. Listen, praise God. Amen. Yeah. Packing up would be, it's a serious drag. Amen. You ever moved? You ever, have you ever, uh, somebody, amen? Isn't it like, like a depressing moment when you start the process? The first box right? Have you helped somebody move? You mean that's not the end of the boxes? Amen? There's another, there's another storage unit, amen? I always say travel light. There's, there's a little bit of wisdom in that, amen? Yeah. It's going to get left behind. I think contentment's a learning experience. Uh, don't covet. Uh, the quick, you're fretting and worrying, uh, I, I need that lesson twice over. Uh, you're taking nothing with you, but look with me in Philippians 4, if you would please, in verse 10. I wake up, woke up, I'm lousy at English, I, I got up this morning, amen, and the first sound you hear is rain. <gasps> right? Yeah. Oh, if I could just sleep another hour, but I have to teach this morning. Amen? Praise the Lord. But you know, it, we murmur and complain about just about everything if we're not careful. Amen. I think it's a learning experience, this matter of learning to be content. I think Paul went through some things. He was challenged with some things. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, it tells us, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now the last year care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am. This is kind of annoying, isn't it? Therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. 
Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I know both how to be abased, how to be hungry, how to suffer want, how to suffer affliction, how to do without. That's a tough one, isn't it? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I don't believe Paul just arrived overnight at this level of contentment that we read about with Paul. I think it was a learning experience. And here's my thought on this. I think God will take his children back to the lesson, whether it's first grade or second grade, before he advances him to the next level. Amen. If you cannot learn to be content with what you have now, amen. I think God will take you back to that classroom and back to it until you learn the lesson and God can move you on. You'll find in 2 Corinthians, if you would please, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, For we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Amen. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that, look at the, the, the part, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. How to be abased. Paul learned a few things in prison. I don't think I would have done so well. I'm not convinced I would have been up at midnight singing God's praises. Amen? Have you ever thought about that? It's one thing to preach about the jail ministry. It's another thing to be in jail actually working the ministry. Amen? Right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you know these verses as well. But look, look, look back with me here again. In 2 Corinthians 12... Verse 7. <clears throat> Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Wow. Paul knew, Paul learned this lesson of matter of contentment, of how to be abased. But you know, there's another lesson here of how to abound. Amen. And in some ways, and maybe, maybe I'm, I'm wrong about this, but in some ways, it seems like it's a greater challenge when you have more. Yeah. Amen? It's a greater challenge, it seems like, to stay close to God, to have a spirit of humility, when, when God has blessed you abundantly, far above what we deserve. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, I think Israel wrestled with this constantly. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up. And thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, 
who fed thee with fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which they thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the la thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Are you following along here? Amen. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Amen? It's one thing to go through the tough times, and maybe I'd do better with that. How about yourselves? It seems like when God blesses and God's hand is blessing and prosperity, I don't know what it is. You just start taking God for granted. And after a while, you forget the God of the blessing and you start worshiping the blessing more or the material more. Amen? And sometimes God has to remind you. Amen. Lest thou forget. Amen? I think contentment's a learning experience. If you're challenged in areas, pray for God's help in it. Amen? If you're going through some tough times, Perhaps God is trying to teach us some things, to temper us, to mold us, to shape us, to build some spiritual backbone that we might look to him for help rather than ourselves. If God has prospered, listen, if God has prospered, God forgive me. As God has prospered you, have you found yourself more thankful or have you found yourself forgetting God this past year? Amen? Yeah, I think contentment's a learning experience. Paul how to knew both how to be a base and how to abound. Now, and the last one here, 1 Corinthians, not for the lesson, but 1 Chronicles 29. I like how the scriptures penned here in 1 Chronicles 29 regarding David. Um, Amen. Boy, if somebody uh, was blessed of God, I tell you what. But what's neat about David is I just don't think as you study the life of David, he really put that much emphasis on the material. Amen? Have you read the life of David? Amen. My word. Huh? It just didn't seem to really... had greater things on his mind. Amen. Amen? And it puts the rest in perspective. Look with me in 1 Chronicles 29, 1. It says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Amen. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. And you look at here with David's heart, where his heart is at here. The gold, the silver, the brass, the iron. And you'll find in verse 3, the key is, it's moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. Amen. Amen. I have my own proper good of gold, and so on and so forth, and so on and so on and so on. David had a perspective. David had a heart. David had an affection for the things of God, and it affected his giving here. And you'll find it affected others in verse 6. Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel, oh, guess what? They offered willingly too. And, and listen, it's a lesson for parents. Amen? It's a lesson for parents, a lesson for the church as a whole. Where your affections are set, where they're set, affect the horizontal. The children pay attention. Dads and moms, if this is really important to you, boy, they, they, they figure that out really quick. Amen? But they'll also figure out, and they can't miss it, if your affection is set to the house of God, there must be something about God. Amen? That's important. There must be something about the house of God. Amen? It affected people's giving here, the chief of the fathers and princes. Whoa, they offered willingly. Then you'll find in verse 9, guess what? The people got the vision. They rejoiced, for they offered willingly. Because with perfect heart, they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. But you'll find here in verse, verse number 10, it says, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Amen. I like how this is penned here. It says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, yes. and the power, Amen. and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty, for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Praise God. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore our God, 
We thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I? Yeah. And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in a house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand, and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me and the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. Have given unto them, and given unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things, and to build the palace for the which I have made provision. Wow. Wow. Amen. Amen. Now, if anybody could have rejoiced about God's provisions, King David could have. If anybody could have got haughty and lifted up, David could have. But this is an amazing chapter. Amen. Both riches and honor come of thee. And in thine hand is power and might. Thine hand it is to make great and give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Amen. Huh? I think contentment's a learning experience. I don't think it comes overnight. Amen? I think sometimes I'm getting a lot of the energy to pile up wealth anymore. <laughs> Amen? But you know, after a while, it just doesn't satisfy. Yes, it's nice to have. Yes, 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 yes. But there's no lasting satisfaction in it. God knows our needs. He knows our wants. Amen? And I believe he, he meets them as only God can. Some can handle more, some less, but God meets the needs and the wants. Amen? Contentment, I believe, is a learning experience. But here's the question I have. This is the actual lesson this morning. Is there room to be discontented? Is there room for discontentment? <laughs> How about this? Let me throw this out. How about in the area of spiritual growth? Amen. Oh, Amen. How, how was 2014? Are you more merciful at the end of this year than you were at the beginning? Are you kinder now than you were before? Or you have a greater spirit of humility than before? How about long-suffering, forgiving, charitable? Amen. Is there room for discontentment? How about the area of spiritual growth? It's like a report card check, Second Peter chapter 1. It's a good chapter to go to to pray over, to ask for God's help. I'm glad I'm saved. I thank God for my salvation. However, there are times, and probably more often than not, I'm, I'm not happy with my level of spiritual, right. amen, maturity. Often it's immaturity yet. And I pray for God's help. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it says... Beside this giving all diligence, God wants us to add to our faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and the patience God in us. Are you, uh, have you found out kind of where you're at on this list yet? I haven't got past the, the virtue part yet. Amen? God help me. And if I told you I was godly and, and I was kind and I had a massive amount of charity, I'm lying to you this morning. Amen? The patience, godliness, and the godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find this matter of, of spiritual growth you're probably not going to get it from the TV set. You're probably not going to get it, probably not from the radio. I know there's different shows, blah, blah, blah. 
But listen, John 6.63, very quickly here for time's sake. You know these verses. You should if you've been in this class for any amount of time at all. John 6.63. We're talking about spiritual growth. Amen. John 6.63. This is a great verse. Uh, they all are, but this, this, this really nails it down. And John 6, 63 tells us, It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, uh oh, they are spirit and they are life. Now, you're concerned about spiritual growth? Now, I'm not talking about emotional growth, amen? I can, I can uh, be having a great day, the sun's out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I finally got enough sleep, and I can be really kind for about an hour. Amen? And that's pushing it. Amen? And the kindness check comes with the some, somebody or someone that's highly annoying occasionally to you. Amen? That's just like God checks you off with that. You follow what I'm saying? God will bring just the right person in your life to do a check. Right? Amen? So if God has brought me into your life this morning, praise God for it. Amen? That's the annoyance check. Did you feel annoyed or were you glad to see me? Amen? You can lie. It's all right. No, it's not. Amen? But listen, God wants us to add to our faith. So if you look back at 2014, at the beginning of 2014, to the, to, to the start here of the new year, well, how is it with you this morning? Amen? Maybe it's just a spirit of laziness. You just can't get the wheels moving. God will help you with that. Maybe it's a forgiving spirit. You just don't know how bad things are and how I was, I was done so badly. God knows all about that too. Amen? But how is it? Maybe it's just simply getting up to the house of God. I'm still challenged with that on a Sunday morning. Pray for me. Huh? Yeah. Maybe you haven't shared the gospel with a single person since the day you were saved. Why not? It's a challenge. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we talk about the word being quick and powerful, the flesh profiting nothing, the word being spirit. You don't want to talk about spiritual growth. There's a challenge. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, look carefully here, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, why, that she may grow thereby. See, that verse number 2 takes care of the verse number 1. Amen. Yes. We're talking about spiritual growth. Listen, don't be satisfied with just getting by, and that's another part of, uh, of the lesson today in this matter uh, uh, is there room for discontentment. In the area of spiritual growth, pray for me as I pray for you, please, because you'll find in Philippians, if you look quickly there with Philippians chapter 3, I'm just going to read a couple verses here. Paul hadn't arrived yet either, but he wasn't content with just marking time. Amen. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 tells us, Brethren, I count my, not myself to appre have apprehended but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was not satisfied with just getting by. So if you look back at 2014, listen, take note, learn. Amen? Learn from it. Ask God, show me where, where my failings and shortcomings are. And here's the scary thing, he will. Not for our, not for for our betterment. Amen. Yes. Here's another one. Is there room for discontentment? How about in our service to the Lord? I put a note here. Are we content with just getting by? Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 tells us Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. Amen. Listen, God wants our best. Uh, I don't always feel like giving it, and God forgive me. But God wants our best. So 2014 was a half-hearted effort. And God has blessed you with a particular ministry. It's just been half-hearted. Listen, uh, God wants to use each and every one of us in an area and aspect of the ministry in some capacity. 
whether it's playing an instrument or singing or teaching or, or so however God has a specific ministry even you say well it's just prayer praise God for it amen but listen do with the might in Malachi chapter uh, 1 very quickly Malachi chapter 1 again we won't read all this for the sake of time But Malachi 1, 6, it says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest that despise my name. And you say, Where have we despised thy name? Here it is. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And you say, Where have we polluted thee? And you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. If you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? If you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us, that hath been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you that should shut the doors, would shut the doors for not? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for not. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Gentiles, in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, in a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, and they say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. But cursed be the deceiver, in verse 14, which hath in his flock a male and vow with a sacrifice unto the Lord, a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. God wants our best. There's much in this chapter. I can't exhaust this chapter. Amen. But what God has blessed you with, if even if it's just being in the house of God, being a prayer warrior, do it with all your heart. Amen. It's not for you, it's for the Lord Jesus Christ. Another area of discontentment, very quickly here, and there's so many... How about this world? We're not to... Well, look, very quickly. James 4.4. 4. I'm going to run out of time here. Forgive me. James 4.4. 4. James 4.4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Not to be friends with the world, you'll find in uh, 1 John 2.15, we're not to love the things of this world. Romans chapter 12, turn there quickly. Romans 12, <laughs> race in that clock. Romans 12, we're not even to be conformed to this world in verse 2, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, is there room for discontentment? In quick review and we're done here. In the area of spiritual growth, how is it this morning? Amen? How about in our service to the Lord? Are we doing? Are we content with just getting by? I've got this world, strangers, we're supposed to see sojourners in the land, just passing through. Are we too close? Amen? And then the last one, this tabernacle. The sin problem. Amen? I'll direct you to 1 John in your own reading afterward. This stand will be dismissed with a word of prayer. Sorry about running up against the clock, but uh, take some time. This tabernacle, the sin problem, it's an ever-present headache, isn't it? Amen. Yep. Paul was challenged with it in Romans 7. Yep. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ. May we be content, Father, with thee in your blessings. We need your hand of blessing on the service to follow. May we appreciate, Father, the Word of God. May we appreciate each other. May we appreciate the privilege of being here today. God help us to redeem the time. May Jesus have the chief seat. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you to know and do his will today. God bless you each for being here.